All right, hi. Welcome back to 19th and 20th century philosophy. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're talking about Karl Marx. Now, Karl Marx was a philosopher, a journalist, a historian, a sociologist. Um, he's had an impact on many fields. He's obviously uh, known as a revolutionary thinker, um, and he was an activist. He was participating in various, uh, various political groups. Marx is most well known as an advocate of communism, though that's one of the things he wrote probably the least about uh, and the least specifically, or the least detailed uh, uh, things about. Um, like John Stuart Mill, Marx was a well-known political economist in his time, wrote in German and in uh, English uh, and published in both. Um, unlike uh, Mill, Marx received a university education um, at the universities of Bonn, Berlin, and Jena. Um, he wrote a dissertation on um, ancient Greek philosophies of nature and Democritus and um, uh, Epicurus. Uh, so um, definitely steeped in philosophy. Early in his career, Marx was a devotee of Hegel, uh, a member of a group of radical philosophers known as the Young Hegelians, um, who took from Hegel his dialectical method um, and his commitments to, to freedom and reason uh, and his tendency to see the, the triumph of freedom and reason as unfolding through history. Um, but they took Hegel's thought in a more radical and utopian direction and tended to reject the more metaphysical aspects of his thinking. Now Marx moved away from the young Hegelians as he came to see the technological forces and social relations of, of economic productivity as the real drivers of, of politics and history um, and the real sort of um, backing of power. And that shift in his thinking um, is what eventually led him to uh, pen his master work, which is known as Capital or Das Kapital. The first volume of this work was published in 1867. The work as a whole remained unpublished in his lifetime and unfinished. Um, so the first volume was published. Um, the second and third volumes in the state that they existed were published by his collaborator, Frederick Ingalls. You know, Capital is uh, perhaps the last great work of classical political economy. After Marx's death, um, economics went in a very different direction. Um, Capital is also a major literary achievement and philosophical achievement in many respects, um, some of which we'll talk about today. Um, what I had you read for today are uh, these two pieces, um, A Strange Labor from 1844, uh, sort of early-ish work by Marx, um, penned uh, when he was living in Paris. Um, this is also sometimes translated as alienated labor. And you also read the fetishism of the commodity and its secret from, uh, from Capital uh, from 1867. Um, uh, so, so one relatively early work, one from this um, masterwork, both touch on uh, economic issues, but also political, philosophical issues and ethical issues um, related to economic exchange. Okay, so let's talk about the essay, Estranged Labor. Now, according to this essay, there are four senses in which labor is alienated or the worker is alienated. Um, uh, and if you think about it, estrangement or alienation, there's, there's, there's the one who is estranged and there's the thing they are estranged from, right? Or alienated from. So the in, in each case, it's the worker is estranged from something, right? The worker is estranged from the product of their labor, right? Or alienated from the product of their labor because, um, you know, they produce it in the factory and then uh, the owner takes control of it and they no longer, they no longer have it. They no longer have a relationship to it, right? The worker is alienated from their productive activities. They're not in control of, of how they labor or what labor they do, right? Their, their labor is directed by someone else and is often, um, you know, done under harsh and unwelcome conditions. The worker is alienated from their fellow workers. Um, uh, they're not seeing each other as um, part of some uh, sort of 
collective or, or brotherhood or, or um, social group with a kind of cohesion. They see each other as competitors for, for jobs, as sort of individuals separate from one another um, uh, who have no shared interests. Um, and the worker is alienated from their own human nature. What Marx, uh, in this essay, uh, the, the term is translated as species being. Basically, the worker is alienated from the kind of activities of life that make them distinctly human, including their own freedom. So these are the four senses uh, that Marx argues under capitalism, the, the worker is, is estranged or alienated, right? So let's look at the second text, The Fetishism of the Commodity uh, uh, and Its Secret from Capital. And this is a very difficult text, um, but it's also, I think, philosophically crucial to understand Marx's theory of capitalism, how capitalism works, um, and uh, the ways in which we tend to systematically misunderstand the, the situation that we're in, in capitalism. So, um, when we buy things and sell things in the marketplace, right, we're, um, we're focused on these physical objects, the commodities, right? Um, coats and shoes and, and uh, apples and oranges and so on, right? Um, and we come to associate the economic value that these things have with the objects, right? Um, as if the value is somehow a property of the object or uh, at least a kind of relationship between two objects, right? So we might say this coat is worth two pairs of boots, right? Or um, if we're a little bit more sophisticated and we're using uh, money, we might say this uh, this uh, coat is worth 10 pieces of silver or um, it's worth $20 or what have you, right? Um, in this case, I'm, I'm sort of comparing two objects, right? Um, and thinking about their value as a relationship between the objects. And I'm participating in commodity fetishism, right? Um, fetishism here, you know, the reference to fetish is not sexual. It's a, it's a reference to certain kinds of religious superstition, uh, according to which objects are said to embody certain divine powers, right? So this is a term that Marx picks up from religious anthropology, or anthropology of religion. Um, and, and sort of brings into economic theory, right? So um, if you think about what economic values are, they're not relationships between objects or properties of objects, they're relations between people, right? Um, they're, they're so, economic values are social relationships between people, between the activities of various producers, between producers and consumers, between capitalists and workers, all of those things are, um, uh, you know, the, the, are, are what determine economic value, right? Um, so we tend to like, you know, we tend to fetishize, we tend to, to think of, of the things as being valuable, but it's their, it's, their, um, it's only sort of indirectly by, by the fact that they participate as mediators of these social relations that they have economic value, right? Um, so social relations and facts determine economic value, not the sort of inherent feature of objects or the relations between them. And you can think about this, I mean, um, one of the things that's most valuable in the world, right, is air, right? Without, a f without it, a few, for a few seconds, um, maybe a minute, uh, you're gonna be in a bad way, right? Air is super valuable to you. Its use value, as Marx would say, is very high. Um, but uh, air is not something that participates, at least not yet, in a system of economic exchange, right? It has no economic value. Um, uh, now, you know, you might say, well, if I, if I live somewhere with really clean air, um, maybe the housing prices go up, although not necessarily, depends on where you are. Um, but for the most part, air has, has no economic value. It's free, free to breathe, right? Um, it's only by virtue of participating in the system of social relations that something has an exchange value. Um, uh, and so Marx tends to prefer that notion of exchange value uh, as a way of thinking about economic value because it, it forefronts economic exchange as part of the set of social relationships that the commodity participates in 
in virtue of which it has value, right? Um, so those are some of the key ideas from the readings, which we'll talk about in class. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of, of Marx, who he is, and, and where this work is coming from. Um, and I look forward to discussing with it, uh, discussing it with you in class. If you have any questions, feel free to send a note on the Discord or um, uh, even leave a comment on the video. Otherwise, I will see you uh, in class or next week. Bye.